player this man has turned out to be. He's going to have nightmares about Peyton Hillis. Barnish is just having an amazing season. He's been a human highlight film this season. Number 10, Sidney Rice. Kicking off our list is the player who was most responsible for Brett Favre's return to greatness in 2009. Sidney Rice enjoyed a stellar year as Favre's top target, catching 83 passes for 1,312 yards and eight touchdowns. But before Rice's stardom, his first two seasons in the league were about getting his feet wet. Rice recorded back-to-back -back years catching four TDs, but his receiving yardage dipped in his second season. However, after another modest start in year three, Rice took off over a four-game stretch that undoubtedly made his Hall of Fame quarterback proud. They can't cover him. Well, you've always said that. Right. Now you're starting to believe me. During that span, Rice set his career high in receiving yards twice, with 176 against Baltimore, and then again in Week 10 against Detroit, going for 201 that time. Far fakes a handoff, boots out to the right. He has Sydney in single coverage. He'll fire that way, and it's caught! And it's pass interference! Frank Walker had no chance, so he had to grab Sydney at the 20! Between those weeks, Rice set a career high in receptions with 10 in a 136-yard effort against the Steelers. But Rice's most memorable performances that season came when it mattered most. Against the Cowboys in the NFC Divisional Round, Rice torched Dallas for 141 yards and a trio of TDs. On third down, Farr backpedaling as he lost it for Rice. How good is that combo? That's their third of the day. Touchdown, Vikings. Despite the Vikings falling short in dramatic fashion, Rice proved his worth that season as one of the league's top offensive weapons. He was rewarded with his only Pro Bowl nod, finishing fourth in the NFL in receiving yards. While Rice broke out in his third season in the league, he couldn't quite return to form over his next four years. His production dipped heavily in 2010, and he never recorded more than 50 receptions, 750 receiving yards, or seven TDs in a single season. But a move to Seattle was rejuvenating as Rice closed out his career in 2013 by winning a Super Bowl with the Seahawks. Number 9. Jameer Miller Some might say Jameer Miller's final season in the NFL was lucky, but really the veteran linebacker was just saving his best for last. That's called a waterfall, baby. That's what's about to occur today. A windfall, more so I should say. Before Miller burst onto the scene late in his career with the Browns, his previous five seasons were spent as a solid starter but not a flashy playmaker in Arizona. Serving mainly as an off-ball linebacker, Miller compiled at most five and a half sacks in a season. But when Cleveland brought Miller in to fill a veteran presence on defense, he took it upon himself to take it up a notch. After recording a career high in tackles his first season as a Brown, Miller exploded in 2001 for a career-high 13 sacks and four forced fumbles. In what would end up being his last NFL season, Miller wreaked havoc, compiling at least one sack or takeaway in five of the Browns' first six games. Hasselbeck again, in the pocket and crushed. Denver on second down, good coverage. And he's picked off, Jameer Miller. Burbank with the play fix, sets up, and shovel again, and the sack, loses it. Loose ball, Cleveland recovers. The back half of Miller's punishing 0-1 campaign was equally as productive. He tormented familiar foes, highlighted by a hat trick of sacks against the Jaguars. with his third sack of the day. What a player this man has turned out to be. Miller put forth a first-team all-pro effort, powering Cleveland to the brink of a playoff berth with his pass-rushing, run-stuffing, and turnover-causing skill set. He brought a certain swagger back to the Cleveland defense, becoming their first Pro Bowler since 1994. Number 8. Gary Barnage. From one Brown to another, Gary Barnage had his unicorn season on the shores of Lake Erie in 2015 when he caught 79 balls for 1,043 yards and nine touchdowns. Honestly, I didn't even know who Gary Barnage was when I first saw him. 
I didn't expect Gary to be that good, to be honest. Those nine touchdowns were the most by a Browns tight end since the legendary Ozzie Newsome in 1979. But before Barnage found success in his second to last year of pro football, he experienced plenty of mediocrity. Barnage started his career in Carolina, and in five years with the Panthers, he amassed just 320 yards, never recording more than three receptions in a game. Barnage signed with the Browns in 2013, though the veteran tight end would experience more of the same during his first two years in Cleveland, catching 13 passes for fewer than 200 yards in both years. Wearing the same number 82 jersey as Newsom, Barnage's 2015 performance went down as one of the most improbable offensive outputs ever, especially considering Cleveland went 3-13 that year while rotating through three starting QBs. The freshly turned 30-year-old ripped off a ridiculous six-game stretch in which he either caught a touchdown or posted 100 yards receiving, often doing both. Left side for Barnage, what a catch down by the pylon, and they rule him out of bounds. Barnage even made what possibly was the 2015 catch of the year in a week five win against the Ravens. He's going to fire it towards the end zone, Barnage up in the air, and he battles for the ball, and he's got it in his lap, he's right on the goal line. Uh, Barnage made an incredible catch in his lap, touchdown Browns. From week three on, Barnage was targeted at least six times in every game but one. Previously, he'd only been targeted six times in a game just once in his career. His wild six-game stretch yielded 512 receiving yards and six touchdowns. It's a third and three. Browns trying to get on the board. McCown, Enzo. It's caught by Barnage! But his dominance didn't stop there. In the season's last eight games, Barnage added three more touchdowns and five more games of over 50 yards receiving. Manziel throwing touchdown! As Cleveland's most potent offensive threat, Barnage was well-deserving of a Pro Bowl nod. While he did play one more season in 2016, posting respectable numbers, as far as one-season wonders go, Barnage is as good as it gets. Journeyman wide receiver Brandon Lloyd had to wait eight years before having a breakout season with the Broncos in 2010. The Pro Bowler that year caught 77 passes for a league-leading 1,448 yards, adding 11 touchdowns. Scott Case was a consistent starter at cornerback throughout his career, playing mostly for the Falcons. But in 1988, he picked off a league-best 10 passes, earning him a much-deserved Pro Bowl nod. In 2006, running back Liddell Betts defined the phrase, next man up. When Washington starter Clinton Portis suffered an injury, it was Betts who stepped up to the plate and delivered, posting an impressive stat line of 245 carries for 1,154 yards and four TDs. Jordan Cameron's 2013 Pro Bowl campaign was truly a diamond in the rough. He more than doubled his production from the next closest season, making 80 catches for 917 yards and seven touchdowns. Welcome to the show. My name's Barry Foster. Let's see what happens. Number seven, Barry Foster. Yes, welcome to the Barry Foster Show indeed. The little proven talent burst onto the scene in his third year when he became the bell cow back in Pittsburgh. However, before Foster dominated in 1992, his first two years in the league were rather pedestrian. As mainly a special teamer and backup running back, Foster accounted for 691 rushing yards and just two TDs over two years. But Foster was ready to put the league on notice in 92. In the first two weeks of the season, he powered the Steelers to key wins against the Oilers and Jets, rushing for 107 yards in a TD and 190 yards in two TDs, respectively. First down, Steelers. The hole right side, Foster to the 10, he's going to score. In the middle of the season, Foster's 100-yard game streak coincided with Pittsburgh's winning streak. Weeks 7 through 9 saw Foster and the Steelers blow out the Bengals and Chiefs while also securing a divisional win against the Oilers on the back of three 100-yard rushing games. 14th play of the drive, third and goal. This is a touchdown for Barry Foster. For context, Foster posted only two 100-yard rushing games before his breakout season, a year in which he tied a then-NFL record by Hall of Famer Eric Dickerson for most 100-yard games in a season with 12. In a year in which Pittsburgh defied the odds and won the AFC Central, Foster was the lone bright spot in a divisional round loss to Buffalo, rushing for 104 yards. 
Foster's 1992 performance, rushing a league leading 390 times for 1,690 yards and 11 touchdowns was more than anyone could have imagined. His carries and yards that season still stand as Steelers franchise records. After finishing second in rushing yards behind Emmett Smith, Foster was rewarded with a first-team All-Pro nod, not to mention he finished second in MVP and Offensive Player of the Year voting behind Steve Young. Foster's next two seasons were solid, but weren't quite as productive as 1992. After a trade to Carolina in 1995, Foster failed a physical and was cut, retiring from football soon thereafter. Number 6. Charles White the NFL is a next-man-up league, and there's no better example of that than Charles White's 1987 season. The former Heisman Trophy winner and first-round draft pick began his career in Cleveland, serving mainly as a backup for his first three seasons. But everything changed when he reunited with his former college coach in Los Angeles. Brought in to back up Hall of Famer Eric Dickerson, White continued his tendency of never rushing for more than 350 yards in a season. That is, until the strike season of 1980 rolled around. Between the player's strike, Dickerson's contract dispute with the Rams, and his eventual mid-season trade, a perfect storm was created for a Charles White breakout. In what would be his second-to-last season in the league, White captured the rushing triple crown. He ran the ball 324 times for 1,374 yards and 11 TDs, all league-leading numbers that year. Come week five, White took off rushing for a whopping 166 yards and a touchdown. And off White. Touchdown! After another 150-plus yard performance a week later, White firmly secured the Rams' starting running back role. But he didn't put the league on notice until his monster five-game stretch later in the season coinciding with LA's winning streak. With the Rams reeling at 1-7 entering Week 10, White put the team on his back, rushing for 213 yards and a touchdown in a win against the Cardinals. It is second and two. And here is White with first down yardage and a lot more. Inbounds, touchdown. White kept things rolling in Weeks 12 through 14, rushing for two touchdowns apiece and three blowout wins. Down to the 20, down to the 15, to the 10, down to the 5, touchdown for Charlie White. In just five games during the Rams' winning streak, White accounted for a mind-boggling 723 yards and eight touchdowns. His out-of-nowhere performance in 1987 made him a Pro Bowler and earned him a spot on the All-Pro First Team. The following season, and what would be his last, White reverted to his usual backup role. That being said, not many players can say they've won the NFL's rushing triple crown. Keller comes in motion, and it's Charlie White, touchdown! Number 5. Greg Cook The story of quarterback Greg Cook is a story of what if. In a draft that saw five future Hall of Famers chosen, Cook was the fifth overall pick in 1969, one selection after Mean Joe Green. Slated to start for the upstart Bengals, Cook immediately provided a trusted presence under center. In week one, the fearless rookie helped Sensi eke out a gutsy win against an emerging Miami Dolphins squad on the back of his two TD performance. Greg Cook led the Bengal attack, firing two touchdown passes to Eric Crabtree, the Bengals' leading receiver in 1969. The next game was a sign of greatness to come, with Cook exploding for 327 passing yards and four total TDs and a huge win against the talented Chargers. He is an artist working with bold strokes, and a football field is his canvas for self-expression. With the Bengals rolling early on, no one expected a Week 3 game against Kansas City to be fate-changing. After being sacked and landing on his throwing shoulder, Cook suffered what was later discovered to be a torn rotator cuff and partially separated bicep. After missing three of the next four games, Cook was ready to play out the rest of the season through pain. Against all odds, Cook regained his form in Week 8 against the Raiders, throwing for 189 yards and two touchdowns. And in the following week, Cook played his best game so far as a pro, accounting for 298 yards passing and four touchdowns in a 31-31 tie against the Oilers. In a season in which Cook toughed out 11 games, he threw for 1,854 yards and 15 TDs, earning AFL Offensive Rookie of the Year honors. He underwent multiple shoulder surgeries in the offseason, but the injury kept him out for the next two years. 
Cook retired in 1972 but attempted a comeback in 73, only to retire again after one game, leaving the Cincinnati faithful thinking about what could have been. Filling in for an injured Terrell Davis, Landis Gary flourished in his rookie season in 1999. The Broncos running back rushed for 1,159 yards and 7 TDs, but injured his knee in the following year and never fully recovered. Wide receiver Marcus Robinson enjoyed a nine-year career in the NFL playing for three teams. In his second season with the Bears in 1999, he popped off for 1,400 yards, the fourth highest mark in the league, and nine touchdowns. Patrick Jeffers had one of the more truly out-of-nowhere seasons of all time playing for the Panthers in 1999. The fourth-year player with virtually no previous production went for 1,082 yards and tied for a league's second-best 12 TDs. Number 4. Don Mikowski you can't be a one-year wonder without a little magic, right? Well, the 1989 Green Bay Packers and their starting quarterback had plenty of magic to go around. Mikowski, aka the Magic Man, answered the call to action a year after being the part-time starter for the Packers. The 1980s weren't so kind to Green Bay, and coming off a 4-12 season the year prior, there weren't necessarily high expectations for this team. But after a season-opening loss to Tampa, the Magic Show began against New Orleans. Mikowski led Green Bay back from a 21-0 deficit, completing an improbable game-winning drive giving the Packers a 35-34 win. His 354-yard and 3-TD passing performance was just the beginning of Green Bay's run. Mikowski looking, breaking down, comes over the middle, touchdown to Sterling Sharp! and the Packers have tied the football game. Three weeks later, Mikowski had played his most lethal day, throwing for 313 yards and four touchdowns in a thrashing of the Cowboys. Steps up again, looking, now he wants to throw long down the sideline to Stoding Sharp, caught it, 45-40, 35-30, 25-20, 15, the 10, the 5, touchdown! For Sterling Sharp. In weeks 8 and 9, the Magic Man helped Green Bay capture two more wins with a 367-yard 2-TD effort against Detroit and a 299-yard 2-TD performance against Chicago, in both of which Mikowski led game-winning drives. On the run, he's going to have to throw in the end zone. Throw it on, and touchdown! touchdown! What a throw by Mikowski! He powered the Packers to three straight wins in weeks 11 through 13, including a triumph over eventual Super Bowl champion San Francisco while avenging early season losses to Tampa and Minnesota. Here's the handoff to Fullwood. No, it's kept okay. by McCaskey. Look at him yeah. walk in. He faked to Fullwood and then spun out to the right, and there was nobody who knew it for San Francisco, and he walks into the end zone. But the sweetest win of them all came in week 15 as the Packers solidified a season sweep of the Bears for the first time since 1981, a game in which Mikowski accumulated 244 yards passing and a touchdown. Caught by Kemp, touchdown! That's Mikowski at his best, Jim. The Magic Man's efforts helped the Packers win six games that season by a field goal or less. Even crazier, they're the only team in NFL history to win four games in a season by a single point. Mikowski compiled a league-best 4,318 passing yards, adding 27 TDs. He also led the league with seven game-winning drives, which tied the NFL record at the time. Mikowski earned a Pro Bowl appearance and finished second MVP voting to the man he bested in Week 11, Joe Montana. At the time, Mikowski's six games of 300-plus passing yards were a Packers single-season record. Sadly, in 1990, Mikowski returned to earth going 4-4 as a starter, throwing more picks than TDs. He faded into obscurity, never again throwing for more than 2,000 yards in a season. Number 3. Icky Woods This next one-year wonder was so influential that his touchdown dance went viral before going viral was even a thing. Bengals rookie running back Icky Woods seized the moment in 1988, helping lead Cincinnati to Super Bowl XXIII. Just like Greg Cook, Woods delivered a promising rookie season, but what came after wasn't expected. Woods was firmly inserted into the lineup during a Week 4 game against Cleveland, in which he toted the rock for 62 yards and two touchdowns. And off goes to Icky, touchdown! And he made it in rather easily, so Icky Woods gets his first touchdown. 
from there, Woods rattled off an impressive stretch of games. And just like that, the icky shuffle was born. When I scored, I did the dance and it, it kind of like took off like wildfire. I didn't, I didn't expect it to take off like it did. Woods struck Pater eight times in just five weeks, including two more two TD performances and wins over the Jets and the Oilers in weeks six and eight. Ricky Woods, touchdown. I have never seen that kind of a victory <laughs> dance before in my life. That's the icky dance. For the last seven games of the regular season, he nearly doubled his rushing yard output from the first nine weeks. This stretch included two master classes. One against Buffalo in week 13, in which Woods rushed for 129 yards and three touchdowns, and another the following week against the Chargers when Woods accounted for 141 yards and two more touchdowns. Icky Woods runs 30 yards through everybody for the Bengals score. The budding star quite literally carried Cincinnati to a Super Bowl appearance with two strong efforts in the divisional round and conference championship. His 126-yard one TD game against Seattle was only to be outdone by his performance in the AFC Championship against the Bills, rushing for 102 yards and two touchdowns, including the game clincher. Woods' stellar rookie season saw him compile 1,066 rushing yards and his 15 TDs, which ranked second in the league, still stand as the Bengals' single-season record. He finished third in Offensive Rookie of the Year voting and led the NFL in yards per rushing attempt with a 5.3 mark. After picking up right where he left off at the start of the 1989 season, Woods suffered a torn ACL in Week 2. Woods returned a year later, but he never played an entire season again, retiring from football at age 26. Number 2. Robert Griffin III Keeping up with the rookie sensation theme, perhaps no player was a bigger what-if than RG3. The former Heisman winner set the league on fire when he entered it in 2012 as the second overall selection in the draft. And perhaps no rookie had a grander entrance to the NFL, too, upsetting Drew Brees and the Saints in Week 1 on the back of his 320-yard 2-TD passing day. Redskins first possession. He fires downfield, he's now 7 for 7, as Garcon breaks free. Pierre Garcon will not be caught. Through the first nine weeks of the season, Griffin had compiled 14 total touchdowns, throwing just three interceptions, and a monster 138-yard 2-TD rushing performance against Minnesota in Week 6 had a lot to do with it. Takes the snap, scrambles up the middle, breaks the tackle, he's to the 30. 35-40, up the sideline, 50, RG3, electrified, all the way, into the end zone, RG3 for the touchdown, can you believe it? But it wasn't all positive for Griffin and his team. Washington had stumbled to 3-6 and six more than halfway through 2012. They would need to win out to make the playoffs, and well, that's just what they did. After the bye week, Griffin torched division rival Philly in week 11 for four passing touchdowns. Throwing it up for grabs, looking for Moss downfield. Santana catches it inside the five and stumbles in for a touchdown, Redskins! Surely he couldn't repeat that performance a game later, right? Wrong. Washington won another crucial divisional matchup, this time against Dallas, on the back of Griffin's 304-yard 4-TD game. Griffin keeps it. He's got him. Downfield. Robinson for the touchdown! Coming off the heels of a spirited win against eventual Super Bowl champion Baltimore in Week 14, Washington was actually in worse shape than they thought. Griffin sustained an LCL sprain during that game, and after being rushed back to play, his weakened knee gave out in the playoffs against Seattle. Hey, That's To see him go down in the playoff game like this is very difficult to watch. Shortly after their wild card defeat, Griffin had surgery on his ACL and LCL, but how the injuries occurred was enough to alter his career forever. In 2013, Washington struggled going 3 and 13, and despite Griffin outpassing himself from a year ago, his TD to INT ratio suffered, as did his rushing capabilities. The next year, Griffin sustained more injury blows, this time to his ankle. He ended up playing in just nine games that season, four fewer than he did the season prior. 
After losing his starting job to Kirk Cousins in 2015, Griffin was released and finished his NFL career backing up QBs in Cleveland and Baltimore. But in that fateful 2012 season, Washington ended a four-year playoff drought and captured the NFC East title for the first time since 1999. Griffin had set a then-rookie record for passer rating with 102.4 and was named the Offensive Rookie of the Year and his 815 rushing yards that season still stand as a QB record for rookies. Receiver Michael Clayton's 2004 rookie year in Tampa Bay had Bucks fans thinking superstar early on. Tampa wasn't too talented that season, but Clayton's team-leading stat line of 80 catches for 1,193 yards and 7 TDs was a bright spot. After a legendary career at West Virginia, running back Steve Slayton was also ready to tear it up on Sundays. Unfortunately, Slayton's career quickly became synonymous with one-year wonder, rushing for 1,282 yards and nine TDs in his rookie season in 2008. The lesser-known Steve Smith was also a wideout in the NFL, churning out a Pro Bowl season for the Giants in 2009. He set the Giants' single-season reception record with 107, which was good enough for second in the league. Smith also added a team-best 1,220 receiving yards and 7 TDs. Number 1. Peyton Hillis our number one out of nowhere season goes to the poster boy running back Peyton Hillis. It's only right Hillis finds himself in this spot after perhaps the greatest surprise performance of all time during the 2010 season. In fact, his efforts were so inspiring that fans voted him as the Madden video game cover athlete in 2012, but Hillis' 2010 breakout campaign with Cleveland couldn't have been possible without the coaching change that occurred in Denver a year prior. In Hillis' 2008 rookie season under Mike Shanahan, he opened the season as Broncos starting fullback, rushing for 343 yards and five touchdowns. Hand off left side, and that is Peyton Hillis, who bangs into the end zone, and Peyton Hillis has a Denver touchdown. A year later, Hillis was seldom used under the Josh McDaniels regime. After an off-season trade to Cleveland, Hillis was ready to come alive. In the first two games of the season, Hillis split backfield duties but was able to rush for a touchdown in both contests. It wasn't until week three that injuries in Cleveland's backfield paved the way for a breakout. That Sunday against the Ravens, Hillis rumbled for what was at the time his new career high of 144 rushing yards. This Hillis is a... A runaway train. Go on Landry again, the last line of defense. He's going to have nightmares about Peyton Hillis. Hillis followed up that performance with 102 yards and a TD, helping Cleveland beat Cincinnati. Hillis compiled at least one touchdown in each of the first five games, becoming the first Brown to do so in over 30 years. Hillis, touchdown! Come week nine, Hillis mania really began to take hold of America. He led the charge in a huge upset win over Tom Brady and the Patriots, rushing for two scores while setting a new career high in yards with 184. To him again. Wow. Running room with the ends. Peyton Hillis is loose. Split to the end zone. Touchdown. Week 12 against Carolina saw Hillis join an exclusive bunch. At the time, he became only the 12th player to rush for 130 yards, catch for 60 yards, and score three touchdowns in one game. Gives it Hillis running. He's to the five. He <laughs> blows through a Panther and goes in again. Touchdown, Peyton Hillis, his third of the game. Uh, he turned Charles Godfrey into roadkill. He just ran right over him. Hillis's magical 2010 season topped out at 1,177 rushing yards and his 11 rushing TDs were tied for sixth in the league. His 477 receiving yards added to his total of 1,654 scrimmage yards, which was also good enough for sixth in the NFL. Hillis took a step back after his breakout season, and so did the Browns. Although he finished as the team's leading rusher, his production dropped by about half. Some say Hillis was haunted by the Madden curse, but in reality, the Browns just weren't that good. Cleveland didn't re-sign Hillis after that season, but he found himself on the Chiefs and Giants before retiring from football in 2015.